Have you ever wondered how light rays and beams of electromagnetic radiation were ever first discovered, what they are in principle, and what causes them, and how we can produce them on our own? Well, today we'll be discussing that in a lecture. What's going on, everybody? It's High Peak Education coming right at you with another lecture video, this time on electromagnetic waves and the nature of light. So I'd like to discuss today Maxwell's equations, namely James Clerk Maxwell, the famous Scottish physicist who figured out that there should be an additional term in the integral forms of the equations which describe electricity and magnetism and he predicted theoretically the existence of electromagnetic waves which was later experimentally confirmed and now we know what the solution looks like and now we know what the structure looks like so we'll discuss that today so let's get started so here's Maxwell's theoretical conjecture Maxwell was a brilliant theoretical physicist and it turns out that he started with the theoretical equations of electricity and magnetism that existed before his time. And it troubled him there was no time derivative term in Ampere's law by symmetry. So he started with four equations, namely Gauss's law for electric fields, Gauss's law for magnetism, and then Faraday's law for induction, and then Ampere's law for magnetic fields. Now here's what Maxwell was saying. He was saying that, look, when you have a closed surface area integral of an electric field dot product with some area patch so that you have some enclosed Gaussian surface, the only way there's a non-zero electric field over that surface is that, that there is an enclosed net charge inside that surface. So in other words, what's going on in the boundary in terms of the electric flux tells you about what's going on in the interior, namely the enclosed electric charge. So in some sense, there's a constant source term. Despite the constant source term being in the electric fields equation, there is a source term in the magnetic fields equation. Now this magnetic fields equation has a source term of an electric current. Now this is Ampere's law. That is something constant or something steady, in this case enclosed electric charge, but in this case enclosed electric current. In this case it produces a diverging or converging electric field and by symmetry this produces a circulating magnetic field around a closed loop line integral. By the way, um, something's going on with the symbol here, but this should be a closed loop line integral. And notice that this has the perme permittivity of free space, epsilon naught. This has the permeability of free space, mu naught. This, this is in the denominator, this is in the numerator. So there's some nice symmetry there. It seems like the terms are sort of working out in this theory of electromagnetism. Notice there is no source term in the magnetism Gauss's law equation. That is, if you apply Gauss's law to a closed surface for magnetic fields, you get zero. That no magnetic monopoles exist. That every magnetic field line that goes out of a surface then comes back in through that same closed surface. Okay, so there's no source term here. And there's no time rate of change. Now how about um, Faraday's law? Faraday's law says that an electric field that circulates, so an electric field that's non-conservative, remember this is not an electrostatic field, but an electric field that's non-conservative is produced by a changing magnetic flux with time, and there's a minus sign. So what troubled Maxwell is he said, hey, wait a second, if there's a time rate of change term here, but then no source, why wouldn't there be a source in this term, but then also a time rate of change? Because there'd be a source, no source, no source, source. That would seem reasonable. And then time derivative, time derivative, and then no time derivatives here. So this is something that kind of 
troubled Maxwell, and he was wondering, is there something that's sort of missing in the full-blown version of Ampere's law? And this is what he sought to discover. And Maxwell came up with this idea or this notion of displacement current. Now magnetic fields in a vacuum are produced by currents, which we know to be Ampere's law. And this today we're going to refer to as the conduction current. We often think of conduction current as existing on a conducting piece of wire. It doesn't necessarily have to be a wire, but it turns out that if you have some string of constantly moving charge, that's electric current. So here's something we need to say. Is there another way in a vacuum we can get a string of moving charges? And in fact, a time derivative? Well, it turns out there is. Because Ampere's law here only works for steady, continuous current. Let's see if we can think of an example where even what we know about Ampere's law leads us to something more deeply theoretical. Okay? So suppose you have two circular plate capacitor plates and each of these has opposite charge. This has charge positive Q, this has charge negative Q. And since this is a capacitor, we know that there must be an electric field that exists here between the capacitor plates, especially when electric current comes in and electric current goes out the other side of that capacitor. Now I want you to recall something from Ampere's law. If you recall when I explained Ampere's law I said that what really mattered was the penetrating current. This I here is the current that penetrates through that surface. Now notice when you think about the current penetrating through that surface what you really need to think about is how much current is perpendicular or sort of orthogonal to that area. And that area doesn't necessarily have to be either a circle or just like a flat two-dimensional area. It can be some surface area like so, like this S2, but it can still have um, sort of a closed loop path associated with that uh, surface area. So let's do the following. Let's apply Ampere's law with two closed Amperian surfaces, S1 and S2, to a conduction current carrying a capacitor. Now notice S1 is going to be surface one, which is shown here in blue, and S2 is gonna be what's shown here in kind of this orange color, and that's, um, again, another closed surface. Now what we're going to do is we're going to do the following. Notice S1 is pretty clear that the current that pokes through on this side goes out the other side. So there should be an enclosed poking through penetrating current and there should be a circulating magnetic field this way by the right hand rule and by Ampere's law. But what about S2? S2, notice that it doesn't have any current poking through it. Now, presumably, it would have electric field poking through it between capacitor of the positive plate, positive Q, and then the negative Q plate. And look at this. It shares the same bottom circular path as S1. And since it does, there should be magnetic field circulating around. And you could imagine that if this is a closed surface, then you could say, wait a second, why isn't there any magnetic field associated with this? So notice, no conduction current passes through S2. So it turns out that the magnetic field you would predict then would be zero Teslas in airspace, which is a different result than S1. But you say, wait a second, if it's a different result, then why is it that they have the same path shared here? So here's what Maxwell said. Maxwell said, in order for them to have the same magnetic field circulating around here at this curve, at this point, 
Because again, this is a closed surface, S2. This is a closed surface, S1. The magnetic field should circulate around here because in the same way that conduction current pokes through S1, there should be something poking through from one capacitor to plate to the next through the surface S2 to give us this circulating magnetic field. So Maxwell resolved this apparent contradiction using what he called displacement current. It's like a continuation of this electric current. It's like a continuation of this electric current that's moving and it actually just becomes an electric field. Now notice this actually seems entirely reasonable because we know that an electric current is really a manifestation of an electric field in the direction that the conventional current moves. So the continuation of that current, if you will, to a displacement current. Now displaced just means through vacuum, sort of like not existing in a piece of wire, but that sort of continuing of the electric field from this capacitor plate to this one should also exist. Okay, so Maxwell resolved this using so-called displacement current. And it's like a continuation of the current. So now Maxwell is writing a slightly modified version of Ampere's law where the closed line integral of B dot dS is mu naught times I plus ID where ID is the displacement current and I is the traditional conduction current. And it turns out where if you work this out, how are you going to get ID? Well, ID, the displacement current, there's no electric current here in vacuum space, but there is electric field. And that electric field changes in time. How do we know that? Well, because electric current is the same thing as charge per time. So we should have a change in the amount of charge on these capacitor plates I mean, as a function of time, and we should change this electric flux as a function of time. When we get that change in electric flux as a function of time, it turns out if we multiply that by epsilon naught, we get the units of amperes. So who knew? It turns out that Maxwell's theoretical conjecture that there should be a time derivative a, a component that is term in the equation for Ampere's law was exactly correct and he predicted this should be the case. It turns out magnetic fields are also produced by changing electric fields in time. Now notice this is just the reverse of Faraday's law. Faraday's law said that there should be a electric field that circulates that is produced when a magnetic field changes in, in time. Well now the Ampere-Maxwell law says that there should be a magnetic field produced that circulates from a changing electric flux in time. Now we can finally write down the integral form of Maxwell's equations. Now these are often just called Maxwell's equations. I'm mentioning them in integral form because you will see them written in a different form, sort of invoking some vector calculus and some gradients and uh, derivatives and divergence and things like that and curl. I'm not going to go into all that, but here I'm just going to present the integral forms. So namely, the closed surface integral or the closed line uh, integral. Notice these are going to be four fundamental equations that govern electromagnetic phenomenon. And they are the fundamentals to electromagnetics as Newton's laws are to mechanics. So the first one, again, is Gauss's law for electric fields. The second one, again, is Gauss's law for magnetism, okay? The third equation is Faraday's law, so Faraday's law of induction, and then the Ampere-Maxwell law for magnetic fields. Notice what's going on. Source term, no source term electric field, magnetic field. No source term, source term. El electric field, magnetic field. Notice that no time derivative, no time derivative, time derivative, time derivative. Dividing by epsilon naught, multiplying by mu naught. 
minus sign in Faraday's law, plus sign in the Ampere-Maxwell law. Notice how this, these equations have some really beautiful symmetry and elegance. And for many of you, I'm assuming, this is probably the first time you're ever seeing in their full-blown form, Maxwell's equations. It turns out that you should learn Maxwell's equations. They are the fundamentals. They basically explain everything in electricity and magnetism. And this gives us the full theory of electromagnetism. So this has existed since about the year 1867 or something like that. And as far as we know, this is how things work in terms of electric fields and magnetic fields. So study these equations, learn them, understand them, start to think about their implications. Now, by the way, notice that if there's no time rates of change, then there's going to be no circulating electric fields. There's only going to be electrostatic fields. And the magnetic fields that exist are only from moving charges at constant velocity, namely electric current. Now, what if we don't have any source terms? What if there's no enclosed charges and no steady currents? What if only there's time rates of change of magnetic flux in time and electric flux in time? What if we're out there in the universe in free space and we have no enclosed charge or no enclosed current? Well, notice that these time derivatives should actually give us some changes in flux and these equations should be able to be solved. So Maxwell predicted that the that electricity and magnetism should be able to be transferred in a wave solution over air through empty space. So he predicted that electromagnetic waves should exist. He predicted this again around the year 1867 or so. It wasn't until the 1880s that Heinrich Hertz, the German physicist, was able to experimentally verify this. Okay, so let's think about the implications of Maxwell's equations. Static electric fields begin and end at negative charges. Uh, I should say, static electric fields begin at positive charges and end at negative charges. You know what I mean. Static magnetic fields have no beginning and no end. Again, there's no magnetic monopoles. Electric fields are induced through a magnetic flux that changes in time. Whereas magnetic fields are induced through an electric flux that changes in time or a steady enclosed conduction current. If there's no enclosed charge, no convergence or divergence into or out of a volume of electric or magnetic field lines exist. So no net flux over a closed surface. And notice that if there's no enclosed current, the electric fields and magnetic fields only change due to time rates of change of each other's fluxes. Hmm, seems like they oscillate. And oscillating is what, again, Maxwell was thinking about. So we get this notion of electromagnetic waves. So one solution, believe it or not, that satisfies Maxwell's equations is a mechanical traveling linear wave consisting of electric and magnetic fields that vary with time. Now when I say see applet here, I'm going to refer to you to another video that I produced where I showed the concepts and the intuition behind electromagnetic waves. So this should hopefully be what you remember, that when we have an electric field that's waving around in time and a magnetic field that's waving around in time, notice that at any particular point in space, the electric field and magnetic field should both co-induce one another and oscillate. But then if you just focus instead on a fixed point in space, but if you focus instead on a fixed location on the electromagnetic wave, that should propagate along in time at a constant phase speed. So indeed, the electric fields and magnetic fields are functions of position and time. And again, this is what we know to be an electromagnetic wave. By the way, electromagnetic is a mouthful to say. Sometimes I'll just say EM, 
which is, again, an abbreviation. So notice the direction that the electromagnetic wave propagates is given by the right-hand rule. If you take the electric field, vector, and you cross product it with the magnetic field, vector, you should get the direction of propagation, which is this constant vector here, which we're going to mention here in a moment. So if the electric field is going up the positive y-axis and the magnetic field is going in the positive z direction, the direction of the propagation and the phase speed of these electromagnetic waves should be in the positive x direction. Notice even if you perform the cross product of E vector, which is in the negative y direction, cross B vector in the negative z direction, you'd still get the positive x direction. So let's see if we can understand these in a little more detail in terms of their solutions. In order to understand how these waves are structured and what the full solution looks like, let's first apply Faraday's law of induction to this wave. So you should take a closed loop integral for Faraday's law and notice that, especially if you do it over, let's say, a quarter wavelength, um, the mathematics works itself out kind of nicely. Notice that the B field is exactly perpendicular to this uh, closed loop and the electric field produces positive circulation over here, negative circulation over there, and notice that here's a dx where there's no circulation, okay? So you essentially get this, that the change of the electric field along the x-axis here is minus the change of the magnetic field with respect to time. That comes out of Faraday's law. Now how about applying Ampere's law, in fact, namely the Ampere-Maxwell law, to the same wave? Again, now we choose a closed loop integral and notice that, again, the electric field, or sorry, the magnetic field on this side produces circulation. The magnetic field on this side produces negative circulation. And notice that the electric field is perpendicular to this um, sort of loop the whole time. So using the Ampere-Maxwell law, we should get this equation. The derivative of B, that's the magnetic field, with respect to X, is minus epsilon naught mu naught derivative of E with respect to T. Now notice, these are partial derivatives because the magnetic field intuitively, given what we're saying here, depends upon time and position, so these should be partial derivatives. And same with the electric field, depends upon position and time. Notice the Ampere-Maxwell law gives us the opposite sign and it also gives us uh, these two constants, epsilon naught and mu naught. So if you take derivatives, what do I mean by take derivatives? Take another x derivative here, take another x derivative here, and then what you can do is you'll have some mixed derivatives and you can put these uh, things together. What you can do is you can combine these into two PDEs, that is partial differential equations. These two PDEs are a wave equation in the x direction and in time for the electric field and a wave equation in time for the magnetic field and again in the x direction. Notice that the constant that sits out front here is epsilon naught mu naught but hopefully you recognize that this is just the wave equation. This is the partial differential equation from earlier in the semester that tells us the linear wave equation. Again, this is a partial differential equation, but we do know how to solve it. So if you recall the mechanical traveling waves chapter, we know what the solution is. The solution should be the following, that electric field as a function of x and t is E max cosine kx minus omega t and B as a function of x and t is B max cosine kx minus omega t. K, remember, is the angular wave number, 2 pi over lambda, lambda being a wavelength. 
Omega is what we call the angular frequency, being 2 pi f, f being the frequency in hertz. By the way, the analogous way to write this would be 2 pi divided by period. Okay, so remember that angular wave number is in radians per meter and angular velocity is in radians per second. Now notice this should be 1 over c squared and 1 over c squared should equal epsilon naught over mu naught. If you work that out, c should be 1 over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. And believe it or not, when you work this out and you put in epsilon naught, 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12th, uh, coulomb squared per newton meter squared, and if you work out mu naught, which is 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 tesla meters per amp, you get about 2.998 times 10 to the 8th. And that's exactly the speed of light. So believe it or not, what Maxwell had basically discovered theoretically, and then again, later Hertz was able to confirm this experimentally, is that indeed electromagnetic waves come out when you have a changing electric and magnetic field in time and the energy propagates through vacuum. And the speed it propagates at is exactly the speed of light. By the way, part of the reason we use C, pretty much always, for the speed of light is that it's a constant. And in fact, this is one of the most constant values in all the universe. As far as we know, as of the recording of this video, the year 2020, we know this to be the fastest observable speed in the universe and the speed that light travels in a vacuum. And furthermore, uh, we note that the speed of light is also constant for all observers, which is kind of an interesting thing. And the speed of light is definitely closely related to um, Einstein's field equations, um, special relativity, general relativity, all kinds of interesting effects. Some of those are certainly beyond the scope of this lecture and um, even this second course of physics. But just be aware, this speed of light is really a big deal. Um, this was able to be measured pretty accurately, the speed of light. And again, um, it comes out of 1 over square root of epsilon naught mu naught. One more thing, notice that if you take the electric field and divide by the magnetic field, the electric field magnitude, suppose it was uh, 2.99 times 10 to the eighth newtons per coulomb, and the magnetic field was one tesla. Well, when you would divide these, these cosine functions would cancel. You would get the speed of light in meters per second. And that's because newtons per coulomb, the units of electric field, or for that matter, volts per meter, divided by teslas gives meters per second. Amazing. So there's another relationship to get the speed of light, but namely between the magnitude of the electric field and the magnitude of the magnetic field. Okay, so let's talk about just some general properties of these electromagnetic waves. How do they work? The equations as shown are for free space, um, let's see, with no dielectric or magnetic material present. Let me just make a brief comment about this. Remember, epsilon naught is the permittivity of free space. Free space meaning vacuum. Mu naught is the permeability of free space, meaning vacuum. If you recall when capacitors were discussed in this course, instead of using epsilon naught in our formulation of capacitance for capacitors, if we inserted a dielectric into the space where electric field existed in a capacitor. The capacitance went up, but it turns out that actually changed uh, the, per the permeability of free space. Um, or sorry, I, I said that wrong. That actually changed the permitti uh, permittivity of free space. Because it turns out it's no longer permittivity of free space, it's permittivity associated with that non-vacuum associated with that dielectric material. In a similar way, when I discussed inductors, I also introduced this idea of magnetic permeability, which is not necessarily the permeability of free space. So when there's magnetic permeability, let's say we put an iron core inside of a solenoid, 
Well, that iron core is a ferromagnetic material and increases like the magnetism. So the idea is that you could imagine, look at this, you could imagine that if you had values here larger than one, like in other words, a dielectric or a magnetic permeability, you would increase this denominator and thus decrease the speed. Interestingly enough, the speed of light is going to be a slower effective speed when you have a dielectric material or you have a magnetic permeability material. And it turns out that interestingly enough this leads to lots of interesting effects. Now that means when light propagates through glass its effective speeds a little bit slower or when light propagates through water its effective speed is a little bit slower than its vacuum speed. Now believe it or not the speed of light between any two molecules is still the speed of light itself but if there's more interactions namely electricity or magnetism wise then the effective speed will be slower. But again these equations that I'm showing and for the sake of this lecture I'm just assuming we're propagating through vacuum. In the examples we've shown, the x direction is the direction of the propagation. And by the way, this is often called the ray nature of light. The ray is sort of the line of travel. This c vector, we now know what it is. The magnitude of it is the speed of light. The direction of it is the direction of the phase speed propagation. And that is going to be um, the ray. So in other words, if I have a single beam of light, the direction that beam of light moves is the direction of this single light ray. Waves in which electric and magnetic fields are restricted to being parallel to a pair of perpendicular axes are said to be linearly polarized waves. So in other words, if you have an electric field and magnetic field that are only moving along a single axis, so if we have Let's say an electric field was produced by a straight up and down antenna. Well, the electric field would be confined to where there was this accelerating charge up and down. Now why do I say accelerating charge? Because it turns out that in order to produce an electromagnetic wave, you have to have the, again, magnetic flux changing in time. When we know a steady moving current, which is velocity to charge, is a magnetic field but not a changing magnetic field so you have to accelerate that current so accelerate it to actually produce an electromagnetic wave so it turns out if you accelerate those charges up and down an antenna there's sort of one confined direction to that electric field that's accelerating that's producing these electromagnetic waves and those waves would be linearly polarized because there's sort of a polarization axis to the electric field and sort of a polarization axis uh, direction to the magnetic field. Okay, we also assume that at any point in space, the magnitudes of the electric field and magnetic field at some point x and at some time t only depend upon the position and the time. All these rays are assumed to be parallel for now. In other words, they're far from a source. The collection of waves is called a plane wave. So a plane wave, imagine you have a big piece of glass and each ray is coming towards you and is perpendicular to that piece of glass. Well, that would be a plane wave because it's just a bunch of parallel rays moving together. And the surface connecting points of equal phase of all waves is called a wave front and that's going to be a geometric plane okay so again electromagnetic plane waves are the easiest way to analyze their geometry for now so let's take a look at those plane waves and here's a pictorial representation of electromagnetic waves this is similar to what I showed also again in the intuition video so if you look at a point right here and notice that there's going to be zero electric field and zero magnetic field. But notice that half a wavelength later that'll be the same, but a quarter of a wavelength lit, uh, then we'll have the maximum electric field and maximum magnetic field. Same thing for three quarters of a wavelength. Now notice that this 
image is shown for a constant time. In other words, this is a snapshot in time. What's going to happen if you let time vary? And suppose we're at, I don't know, suppose we're at the point x equals lambda over 4 initially. Well, the electric field and magnetic field at time 0 should be their maximum values. An eighth of a period later, the electric field is decreasing, the magnetic field is decreasing. And notice that when we've reached 2 eighths, which is 1 quarter of a period, notice that this point on the wave has now propagated to the lambda over 4 position. That is the quarter wavelength position. And notice that from there, we say, ah, this has propagated along, and we should not see any electric field or magnetic field. When we reach 3 eighths of a period as the current time, we have a magnetic field which is going the opposite direction from what it originally was, and an electric field that's going the opposite direction of what it originally was. And then once we reach half a period, this is 4t over 8, we should have the electric field being the same magnitude as it was as time 0, but in the opposite direction. The magnetic field, the same magnitude as it was at time 0, but again, the opposite direction. But then, after this moment, those fields will decrease in magnitude again, and then we'll flip-flop to the other way around. And this process should continue. This is what it means for something to be oscillating in simple harmonic motion in time. Now, here's the idea of polarization. When something is polarized, that means the field is sort of along one axis. If the electric field's vertically polarized, again, like a radio tower, the wave is moving towards us. Notice that the electric field's going up and down this y-axis and then the magnetic field is going side to side on the z-axis. So this dot right here means the, the electromagnetic wave is coming out of the page. So in other words, we're sort of looking down this x-axis. So if it's coming out towards us, the electric field is confined to the y-axis, the magnetic field is confined to the z-axis, vertically polarized. By the way, we usually mark electromagnetic waves given the polarization direction of the electric field, only because we know that it's actually charges that need to be moved to produce electromagnetic waves, so the charges, their direction is more sort of coordinated with the electric field. A horizontally polarized um, electromagnetic wave should have its electric field oscillating side to side on a horizontal plane, that is in this case along this z-axis. Again, the magnetic field is perpendicular. And suppose the electric field's vibrating like so, suppose it's vibrating 30 degrees from vertical. We would say that it's off vertical polarization, that it's polarized at an angle 30 degrees relative to vertical. So notice polarization along any axis is possible, but we'll talk more about polarization as it relates to um, polarizing filters by the end of next lecture. So what are some other special properties of electromagnetic waves? Electromagnetic waves are produced when charges are accelerated, that is continually accelerated through oscillations most typically. So if you're continually producing electromagnetic waves, you're continually accelerating those charges through some sort of oscillation. Now by the way, let's think about how we know this. A stationary charge should produce only an electric field, that's electrostatics. A moving charge should produce a magnetic field, but take it one step higher, an accelerating charge should produce an electromagnetic wave. Do you see how we get to le greater levels of complexity? The electric and magnetic fields in electromagnetic waves are transverse waves that are in phase with one another. They're mutually reinforcing one another via the conservation of energy. They travel at this constant speed of light. Again, C is very much a constant in a vacuum. They have a direction that's given by a perpendicular cross product, namely E vector cross B vector is C vector. Notice that the electromagnetic waves have frequencies and wavelengths that are inversely proportional to one another. 
Since the speed of light is constant, when the wavelength goes up, the frequency should go down, or when the wavelength goes down, the frequency should go up. So this is one of, one of the most fundamental things about electromagnetic waves. Remember that frequency is the same thing as saying omega divided by two pi. And notice that lambda is the same thing as two pi divided by k. So if you work this out, you get omega divided by k. Remember that's angular frequency divided by angular wave number is another way to write the speed of light. And the nice thing about electromagnetic waves is they are unique because they require no medium for propagation. And this is kind of an interesting thing because one of the reasons we know that electromagnetic waves transfer energy but not mass and they don't require a medium and that they're unique is because when the sun transmits energy to earth it's transferring energy through vacuum so there's no medium for these electromagnetic waves to propagate to us but indeed the energy certainly is received at earth now the great thing about waves is that superposition also applies you can get constructive interference or destructive interference and a lot of those like wave properties we've discussed before pretty much you know for these electromagnetic waves in fact one thing I want to look at here is the Doppler effect for electromagnetic waves so remember the Doppler effect for mechanical waves had to do with basically the relative motion of a source or receiver toward or away from one another now it's going to look a little different for electromagnetic waves only because we're talking about the speed of light here and that speed of light is so fast so because no medium is required for electromagnetic radiation uh, only the relative speed v can be identified okay so here's like a train and you hear its normal pitch but remember when the train moves towards you you have a shorter wavelength and you hear a higher pitch and then here we have a longer wavelength and a lower sound pitch. But notice if a light source is moving to the right, this observer notes higher frequency light observed. This observer uh, has lower frequency light. Now, by the way, the higher frequency visible light we often call blue shift because blue is at the higher end, namely higher frequency, shorter wavelength, and the visible part of the spectrum, whereas red is low frequency its long wavelength part of the spectrum so we say this wavelength shift even if you have light due to relative motion of source and or observer is again either blue shift or red shift higher frequency lower frequency shorter wavelength higher wavelength depends upon if you move toward the observer or away from the observer so this is going to be the doppler shifted frequency for electromagnetic radiation. Notice it's the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation, speed of light plus the relative velocity divided by speed of light minus the relative velocity. So V is the relative velocity between source and observer. If the motion is away from the observer, V is a negative number in this equation. But if it's toward the observer, it should V should be a positive in this equation. And that should hopefully make sense because if V is larger here, namely in this numerator, you'll get um, a larger numerator than a denominator. So the frequency like we expect should be larger. I will perform this calculation in a later video. And that actually concludes this set of lecture slides. So thank you very much for watching High Peak Education. Please smash that like button if you enjoy this content. Please share this content amongst your social network to grow the channel. I look forward to reading your comments and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.